we'll go over what we're referring to as our, our primals. Um, so the way that we would cut beef here, again, we're gonna talk about the kind of the consumer focus on the end of it and where our beef industry is really trending towards. And then after this presentation, we will take you guys back over to the meat lab. We'll get you a frock, a hair net, a beard net, all the, the good food safety, personal protective equipment that uh, our government requires us to wear. And then we will be in lab for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on dialogue, of course, and, and timing of the, the feedlot trip. But looking at the visual appraisal of the carcasses that you evaluated on the live side. So when we look at beef, uh, beef fabrication, we're going to look first at approximate yield. So that 1,400 pound carcass coming in with the 65% dress on average is going to have uh, an 850 pound, 852 pound carcass weight. Oop. If I can get this thing to work, here we go. So if we look at weight distribution between lean cuts, so lean cuts are becoming very, very important here, and the trimmable fat and bone, so muscle, fat, and bone, and the ratio between those, we have approximately 70% of that carcass is going to be some form of lean muscle tissue. We look at waste, as that becomes important in the evolution of our industry, how much of that carcass is waste fat or fat that would be trimmed off. He talked about this concept of looking at why yield grade fours and fives have a discount. Our consumers are pushing more and more to a leaner cut in the retail sector. And that obviously is going to affect the category of trimmable fat. If we look at the past 20 years, we've gone from roughly there was a point in time where trimmable fat was about 8%, now up to 13% as we continue uh, to trim off excess fat on retail cuts. So going from that quarter inch of fat down to an eighth has really changed the dynamic of, of trimmable fat. And then we have bone. So you can see relative value, of course, is gonna be in lean tissue or in the meat itself, we do have a value with trimmable fat. So edible tallow would be a value that's derived from that. Bone has a value, but you can see that that's only half a percent. So that's meat and bone meal. We get some value out of bone now in high-end pet treats would be another avenue that those kind of end up in. So when we look at our primals, this would be the way that we would fabricate a carcass here in the US. And we can start with the, the round, so the hind leg of that animal, and kind of move forward to the chuck. And we'll look at each of these kind of independently and what retail cuts we would get from each of those primals. But we have the round, sirloin, our loin, or short loin, the rib portion, chuck, and then down below the chuck, we have kind of shank and brisket would be one primal together, and then the plate and flank. So looking at the chuck, Again, this is all of our cuts are specified um, by what's referred to as IMPS, which stands for Institutional Meat Purchasing Specifications. Uh, it ensures that each customer is getting the, the same thing from every packer. So it's a set of uh, guidelines and instructions for how to fabricate a carcass. So you can see 
that for the chuck, the separation mark is going to be between the fifth and sixth rib. And from there, we'll remove the brisket at the anterior point of the cartilage. But really, the chuck, as far as retail cuts are concerned, the, the major retail cuts that we would get out of that would be the chuck roll. This has kind of gone through an evolution over time and now we're beginning to separate out individual muscles of that chuck roll to get chuck eye steaks. The flat iron, relatively tender muscle coming on top of the scapula blade. Adjacent to that on the other side of the scapula would be the mock tender, so a roast. And then we would get boneless short ribs. So those are really the, the retail cuts that we have derived from the chuck itself. Most of the value in this primal will end up as ground beef. Um, it and the round would be very similar in that a lot or a high percentage of that could end up as ground beef. Here in the US, we actually have a a designated area of ground beef products that come from the chuck. So ground chuck is something that you can find at the, the grocery store and simply it is ground beef that the, the trimmings come from this primal. Looking at the plate, really the only things that you would find or be familiar with that come from the, the plate portion would be the short ribs. So there's a very long muscle that covers your rib cage and, and that muscle is where we get the, the short ribs from. The other thing would be inside skirt meat or a portion of the diaphragm muscle. It's oftentimes now used for fajitas. It's kind of uh, very interesting when we look at market data the, the skirt steak, when looking at market data the other day, was trading at a premium to strip loins. Who would have thought? Um, we just purchased some, they're unloading them. I bought strips and skirts for about 10 cents difference this week. Um, so there continues to be growth in that, but the, the largest percentage, if it's not one of those two retail cuts, is then going to go again towards ground beef or trimmings that we use for, for ground beef. The rib itself, so you can see the, the rib section at the very top of this picture coming adjacent to the chuck and the loin. There are about six different ways or six different codes that we can process that, uh, that rib section, mainly looking at the value in the ribeye roll itself. You know, during different times of year, there's a higher demand for bone in versus boneless product. But by and large, most of the, the ribeye rolls in the US are going to be in a boneless product. The back ribs would then be a byproduct of boneless fabrication. Uh, so would the rib lifter meat. So the, the cap, if I can get his pointer here. So the cap right here on top of this rib roll is what's referred to as rib lifter meat. In Texas, it's very common to find at a lot of restaurants, uh, chicken fried steak. Chicken fried steak is just blade tenderized meat of any particular cut. Um, but a lot of the, the food service products that are made come from this rib lifter meat. And then the remainder of that ends up again, you. You see this very familiar picture as trim. The brisket, so what you had for lunch, once was a cut that really in the US had no value, uh, traded at the same price as trimmings or lean trimmings. Now, if we look at the price of brisket, it has really become a, a valuable cut. A lot of that has to do with the, the evolution of the barbecue scene in the US, uh, especially in Texas. So you'll find that if you ask anybody what defines Texas barbecue, it would be, take a guess. Brisket. Brisket. So we've kind of become synonymous with that. 
it's very popular across the United States now, and so instead of having a value of about $1.50, at most grocers you'll see it ranges in about the three and a half to four dollars. So again, the, the other part of that primal not shown here would be the shank, something that typically ends up as a, a trimming item, heavy amount of connective tissue in that, so that's a very niche market for that consumer base who actually eats shank crosscuts, asabuco, and those similar items. And so this would be what's referred to, or what you had at lunch, is a packer's cut brisket. By and large though, a, a large percentage of briskets actually remove the, the decal portion, so that point where you get the, in my opinion, the best meat out of the brisket, the, the moist part, if you had that for lunch, is actually removed and manufactured into sausage. What we find a large percentage of consumers looking for is the flat or that lean uh, meat, typically corned beef, those items would be made out of the, the flat from that brisket. So shank, again, the other portion of that primal, not much to talk about because unfortunately it ends up as a, as a ground beef product. It comes from either end of the shank. We'll cut those shank cross cuts down. Looking at the round, so we've kind of moved back in that animal. We're making a, a circular motion, if you will, from the, the chuck to the bottom around. So this primal is broken into four major muscle groupings. We have the, the top round, the bottom round, and the eye of round would all be made into roast type products. So thicker cut sold in larger quantities for, for braising applications. Uh, we're very synonymous with crock pot cooking here. Uh, so that's where most of those cuts go if they don't end up in, in manufacturing. When we look at the knuckle, this is kind of something that we've begun to, to market to consumers in a different manner. You can still find this sold as a roast, but if you go to our grocery section, what you'll find with most knuckles are that they're sold as steaks. Keep in mind this is coming from the round, so the eating satisfaction is something that we're having to deal with in terms of consumer satisfaction. Just because you call something a steak doesn't mean that it really has the same eating satisfaction as what a consumer thinks of. Typically a consumer in the U.S. is going to define a steak as the middle meats. We can market now a lot of things as steaks. Uh, a lot of that is sold based upon thickness. This would be one that's cut at a quarter inch. So a very thin piece of meat. You would find the same thing in cuts from the chuck as well. So just another way to, to move and market that product. When we look at the loin or the loin section here, this is gonna be a beef full loin. So this would, the, the full loin in the US would have both the short loin portion as well as the sirloin portion attached to it. And so you can see the end of this full loin would be the actual sirloin, and this would be what we refer to as the short loin. And so if we separate out and look just strictly at the, the loin muscle itself, uh, one of the unique cuts before we look strictly at the loin is a muscle that is present in the kind of short or full loin into the round, which is the tri-tip. And so the, the tri-tip muscle is, is marketed and sold, at least in the Midwest, most of them would be shipped to California. So they're very hard to find in the East Coast in the Midwest, because again, we go back to, it defines a cuisine. So if you look at California and their predominant barbecue style would be Santa Maria style barbecue and the cut that they use is the tri-tip. If we take that sirloin off and look at the, 
The loin on the left, what you're going to get is the, the strip loin itself and the tenderloin. And so if we separate those two out, we get fillets at the bottom. Um, I think there's about four or five different ways to call a strip a strip. Kansas City strip, uh, there's a New York strip, uh, strip loins. I think there's a chef in Nevada that patented the, the Nevada strip or the Las Vegas strip. Um, so it's one muscle grouping that really goes by a lot of different names dependent on geographic location. For our South American friends, we have uh, the top sirloin. My favorite cut from the sirloin, of course, is going to be the picanha. You'll notice that I must have some affinity because if you go to the retail store, there's an abundance of them. Um, so that would be the biceps for Morris muscle. But from that, this uh, sirloin is something that we've struggled with lately as far as how do we process and retail this to a consumer. Historically, the method to which this sirloin or top sirloin would be marketed would be to take about a three quarters of an inch uh, slice directly across that whole cut surface. So when you find it in a grocery store, you have a styrofoam tray filled with sirloin. That is a very large portion. And so we'll talk about portion control a little bit, but it's, it's something that's kind of underwent uh, an evolution. So when you look at it in the marketplace now, you really have to be aware of what you're buying because they will take out individual muscle groupings. So this center cut session is marketed as a baseball or a petite sirloin. If you look at baseball sirloins and a cross section of a fillet, you really have to lay, read labels because they look very similar in their appearance when they are vacuum sealed or in the, the plastic vinyl trays. From there, other little pieces that we would get would be a bottom flap and the ball tip as well. Looking at the flank, so the, the flank of course is going to have the flank steak, uh, the highest value in that piece, and then the outside skirt. And so that really rounds out what we refer to as kind of our primals, and then taking and fabricating those down into subprimals. And so you'll see most of these imps or these retail cuts whenever we go over to the lab. So you can actually look at what they, what they look like in appearance and how differences in genetics and diet influence those cuts. You'll see that take the Charlet for an instance is gonna have a, a bigger strip than the little Corrienti steer. And so hopefully you'll be able to see those differences. When we look at actual fabrication value, we can see that for about roughly 25% of the value of a beef carcass is going to come from two items. Now those two items are not created equally by any means. If you were asked what would you like to have for dinner, ground beef or a ribeye, what would most of this room say? Ribeye, right? So the ribeye itself has a fairly significant amount of weight and the value to which we have for that cut is also fairly significant. So we can see that the value, the single greatest value in that carcass is the ribeye roll at roughly 13%. So again, this inverse relationship between weight and pricing for certain cuts, you see that 18% of that animal is going to be in ground beef trimmings or grind. However, the relative value of that 18% is only accounts for 12% of the overall value. And so if we take this uh, kind of a step further and look at the other 25%, so 25% was made up in those two cuts, another 25%
of the value of the animal is made up in 11% of the weight of this animal. So we have the strip loin, the chuck roll, and the tenderloin. So if we look at strip loin, 3% weight, still it's a middle meat. So you'll notice that most of the value derived from this animal is going to come from a middle meat. Okay, so ribeye. Now we have strip loin. Tenderloin would be a middle meat. And we kind of add to that. The longissimus muscle, or what makes up that middle meat, actually extends into the chuck roll itself. And so you can see kind of compositional value of muscle groupings alone. So looking at the, the next 25%, again, a common theme that, that comes through. Now we see cuts, though, from the round, the shoulder clod. So in that shoulder clod, we would get uh, the flat iron would have the, the single highest value in that particular muscle grouping. We have the, the top butt, or that would be the sirloin. So now we're at 75% of the value for that animal. You'll also notice you're beginning to see a change. So in the last slide, we went from 11% weight to get to that value. Now we're at 21.2. So the cost per a pound has come down significantly for this third, and that will continue on to the, the last third. So looking at the last third, you'll notice the amount of value that it kind of gets to, to get through that list. So instead of having three to five items, now we've continued to, to add cuts to make up the whole value. So if you look at the, the top, you know, it's a function of a couple things. Again, weight. So edible trim fat or 50s trim does not have a very high value, but it makes up a large percentage of the carcass. So things in trim fat would be fat that comes off through fabrication, so cutting down to, to meet the, the specification for fat cover on a, on a retail cut. Could also come from, in this case, trimmable fat that's gonna come off would be KPH. All of that is added to this category. You see cuts from the round, still high in proportional value. And then about halfway down, we get to bone and other lesser cuts. So again, bone proportionally only has a 1% value. This is where uh, we've had the conversation of meat to bone ratio being very important because that, that bone portion does not carry a very large value. We have no use for it. It's a, it's a byproduct. So looking at the, the influence and how we can uh, make changes to that, that ratio or looking at how do we change the ratio between fat to lean it becomes important when we look at overall value. And so now that you kind of have an understanding of how we fabricate, we thought it would be a good crash course in the U.S. consumer. So looking at kind of perceptions and trends for the beef industry itself. And the first one that we always highlight would be lean, finely textured beef. Okay, it's, an, it's a commodity now that has rebounded uh, since uh, a lawsuit and other pending litigation came out. Uh, but our consumer base is largely driven by social media or what we hear, what we see. Okay, one of the biggest reasons that lean, finely textured beef had the, the stigma it did with the consumer population was due to ammonium hydroxide. Okay, there was a, a British chef that went on a lot of our publications showing, I believe it was a laundry machine, a washing machine, 
threw in some beef trim and had ammonia that you would use for cleaning purposes. And that is kind of what stuck in a consumer's mindset. Okay, ammonia hydroxide had been used in food manufacturing since the 1970s. It's not a new food a ingredient or a food additive. Okay, it's been used in the bakery industry for a long period of time, but you don't ever hear consumers asking questions about ammonia hydroxide in baked goods. Okay, this was approved in 2001 as a food safety hurdle. So ammonia hydroxide is a gas that is applied during this process to make lean, finely textured beef as a food safety hurdle. So it controls the bacterial population. It's a grass food additive, uh, but kind of the stigma of that stuck with consumers. This product is now, and BPI itself has further diversified uh, in its product portfolio, mainly in the food service category. So this product was not intended to replace ground beef that you get at a retail store. It was uh, a price point driven beef additive that would went to the school lunch program and those other food service entities. Okay. Looking at traditional beef, so what we've been talking about all morning and yesterday, you can see the consumers expectations have shifted over time we talked about in quality grades commercial utility those kind of coal grades they would not make their way into our retail case so what you will find in the retail case today is mainly these top two designations prime choice select once dominated, the retail case is slowly beginning to be phased out with choice products as our industry shifts to a higher quality beef animal. Marketing and branding of those products has become very important, but the consumer perception and dollars they spend have, have focused or driven us towards those three designations. So when we look at the, the last category that qualifies for young beef, which would be standard or no roll, those uh, and eventually end up in either a food service or a processing application. It's, it's very hard to find that beef at a grocery or a retail level. So looking at the branded beef programs, we've We've covered the top three, right? We're all familiar with CAB, Sterling Silver, and Chairman's Reserve. He kind of went over those are, um, at least two would be Packer Brands. 1855 is a JBS brand to again get into that same marketing niche. However, there's 96 other brands and they are widespread in what they represent. My favorite one to put on this slide is there is a branded program for certified Texas Longhorn beef. I can promise you from experience the eating satisfaction is not quite equivalent to CAB. <laughs> right? But in an attempt to try to get into some of these schemes, uh, especially certified Angus beef being the well, best well-known program, you have other breeds. <laughs> So certified Hereford is, is a branded program out there as well. And the whole premise is to expand our marketing potential. And so to qualify, there's a, a heart brand would be, let me go back, is a, the Akaushi. It is actually a, a farm that raises F1s and purebred Akaushi. So the, the red breed, the Japanese breed that we showed in the first picture, that would be their entire herd. Uh, other brands similar in this premium line would be Snake River Farms in the US, which is an American style Wagyu product. 
So to fall into these beef programs, there are quite a bit of criteria that are set up and in place to ensure that a, a packer correctly markets that particular carcass in that program. And so the most well known is certified Angus beef. Whenever it is railed off in a plant, it's identified by having this G1 sticker. And so there's a phenotype and a genotype designation. That designation is that animal has to be 51% black hided. You'll notice not all brands have a, pheno or t a phenotypic or genotypic qualifier. So sterling silver is, is any breed of cattle that qualifies for mainly the, the carcass characteristic portion here. And so to be marketed as CAB in the US, that has to qualify for the upper two thirds of choice or be prime. And you'll notice comparing that qualifier to the Certified Texas Longhorn Association. The, the only real designation that certification has is that phenotypically it has to be a registered Longhorn. That's it. We don't care what the meat is. And so you can see CAB is one of the, the tightest programs to get into as far as specifi uh, specifications are concerned. So again, you have a marbling score you have to meet, but also you'll notice as you kind of go down, they have criteria for weight. So it can't be a large carcass, it has to be less than a thousand pounds. They have a criteria set for, um, for back fat thickness, has to be less than an inch. And if you go and look at above the weight classification, there is a set standard for ribeye area. Travis, I'm just curious, how do you get the long horns into the stun box? There's a reason why we don't kill a lot of them, right? <laughs> uh, in our area, there is only one packer that actually will kill longhorns, and it's the cow plant in Hereford. So they have a, a modified box that is is an open chute to allow those animals to walk in. And so that is, if you notice across and when you go to the feed lot, make a mental note of how many horned animals you actually see. Uh, and if so, they're, they're tipped, right? A producer is only gonna make that decision one time because he will never get his cattle sold to one of the, the major beef plants. Uh, it, it poses too big of an animal welfare issue. Uh, there are other facilities. There was a processing plant in South Texas, so Sam Cain's would have been one that would also process some of those animals. Uh, so as you go down, you can kind of see how hard uh, it is to get into some of these programs and why they become so niche in their marketing. Um, that's not to say they don't change and evolve over time. One of the, the biggest changes that CAB made uh, a while back was to change the actual ribeye area because they weren't getting enough animals qualifying into those programs because of other technologies that we use. So when we were feeding uh, a high level of Zilmax, right, that would obviously have an effect on ribeye area and getting animals to qualify into that program. Other criteria that are used in beef outside of branded programs are what's referred to as criteria programs. They are non-specific criteria. So you'll notice that we have everything from hot dogs to the American Heart Association to genuine Texas beef. So genuine Texas beef was a partnership between Cargill and a, a Texas grocery chain called United to, to make sure that all of the cattle marketed in that scheme were raised in Texas and slaughtered in Texas. So that's kind of the criteria that qualify. Diametrically opposed to that would be the American Heart Association. That criteria simply states that it has to be one of the 26 lean cuts identified by the American Heart Association to receive that seal. So it is a, a lean beef cut. 
a fresh meat cut that would have that designation. And then we get to processed meats products. Uh, Nathan and a lot of other processed meat products would now have these on their products as well. So Angus, simply put, the animal was 51% black hided in most instances. We don't have true phenotypic data on every animal to state that truly was Angus. It showed at the slaughterhouse to show characteristics of that breed, so it's qualified. Is that the only black breed we kill in the US? Not even close. So there are a lot of different breeds that make this kind of composite and that's something to think about. And then we have beef franks. Just simply put, all of the protein utilized in manufacturing that product comes from a beef animal. There's no chicken, there's no pork in that product. Again, he's touched on this, all natural. So we're gonna segue more into niche markets for a minute and that not all natural brands are created equally by any means. Uh, the, the criteria that we use are not clearly defined and they're really up to the, the producer and the processor to make and set that criteria. There's different values for that criteria as well. One that would fall in here uh, would be NHTC, but we don't really uh, have that as a, as a consumer focus, but that also is strictly kind of aligned with this natural beef programming uh, from a consumer standpoint. So again, we've, we've kind of covered that, so it's a mute point. But one thing to take away from this NHTC conversation is the, the talking point uh, a few years ago was implanted beef has a high percentage of estrogen. And that uh, simply is not true when we look at actual nanograms. So you can see the, the difference between an implant and a non-implanted steer is 0.6 nanograms of difference. You know, to qualify for actually having a physio physiological change, you would have to be in over 20,000 nanograms to have a biological response. And you eat and produce estrogen daily. So think of other things that we consume that have a, a much higher, a much more significant load in terms of estrogen. Something like cabbage has 2,000 nanograms of estrogen per a three ounce serving. And so you can see kind of the, the effect between biologically you're already producing, you can see an adult male is producing 100,000 nanograms a day of estrogen. If you want to take that to the extreme, uh, my wife is pregnant right now with our, our first child. Well, we're talking 90 million nanograms of estrogen on the, on the ends of the extreme. And we consume as a population, I mean, this is kind of changed, but societally, we're already ingesting. So take the, the, the birth control pill. It's got a triple bonded carbon that actually makes that estrogen orally active. But if you go back to the last page, right, that's 400,000 nanograms of estrogen that would be circulating, which gives your body the uh, signals that it's pseudo pregnant. And so you begin to produce and maintain high levels of progesterone, which is obviously going to inhibit other hormones that would have stimulated um, ovulation. Organic beef, a growing segment in the US to, to some degree. Uh, if you go to most grocery stores, you will find now some percentage of organic uh, beef in the marketplace. It's a, a trend that's really changed in the past decade as far as availability of that product is concerned. To qualify as 100% organic, it must be, again, organically produced. So the actual feed components have to be organic in their basis. 
you can see the, the list of what's allowed on the right and what's not allowed to, to get the certification. This is a, a program that is controlled by the USDA. So they set the criteria for what qualifies into that program. So, sure. So a byproduct. In this instance, a, a byproduct is largely going to be meat and bone meal or some other source where we can't confirm what was fed. So a lot of the, the other byproducts that would go into that would be animal byproducts, uh, distiller's grains. Can you verify that the, the corn came from an organic source? Um, so when we talk about byproducts, almost impossible. Um, it's a very possible only in the paper. <laughs> and from a niche marketing standpoint, it's very expensive to feed. And there there are slowly some ways to get around labeling. This category has really changed and become the grass-fed category, if you will. When we talk about organic, it's changed. Not so much on a fresh meats basis, but on a value-added processing basis. So we find more beef in the category ends up as a, as a value-added product than it does as a fresh meat cut. The great example of Organic is, and I, I want this concept to kind of go away, is there's nothing organic about this hot dog. Okay, the beef may be organic, but if, uh, if you take anything away, uncured. Uncured in our world is something that is going through revision. USDA is actually looking at that label term. So to be uncured, Simply put, it means that that product was cured with a natural analog of nitrite. In this case, you'll see it has a, a quote on it that would say, comes from those no nitrites or would come from nitrites that are derived from celery powder is something you would, you would see. Oscar Mayer a year ago switched all of its products to this natural uncured brand. So they're using celery, which what's the water content of celery? 95% that they're growing in soil that has been fertilized or impregnated with a high load of nitrate that essentially will make its way or be absorbed in that cellular root. It'll be dried out. It'll go through a, a biomechanical fermentation process to which the, the nitrate is converted into a readily available nitrite. And then it will be spray dried into a powder and then used. Tell me what is natural about that process. Uh, just instead of making synthetic nitrite, we've found a, a natural source for that nitrite, and that's fairly common in the industry. But other things you're going to find in this brand will be humanely raised, no antibiotics, never have I ever, my favorite, gluten-free. you find in the retail case, I encourage you to go look, uh, at least here locally, you will find fresh meat, not even processed meat, that has a gluten-free sticker on it. In the US, we sell water that is verified non-GMO. So this is marketing at its finest, and that's a point to take away. And that goes hand in hand with grass-fed. We went and bought some grass-fed steaks last night, and unless you actually consume this product on a daily basis, there are night and day differences between what you can find in a retail case that qualifies as grass-fed. There were steaks at United that had a quarter inch of back fat with pearly white fat 
right next to some nice high beta carotene to the blue steaks. This is an unregulated marketing program. Okay, USDA does not have any oversight or control. Uh, they've made that decision five years ago that grass-fed is not a USDA product. And so what we find, this segment of our industry are those that might finish on grass or have grass and then are grain finished on pasture that would still classify as those being pasture raised and on a, on a grass paddock. So there's a wide interpretation of really when you go to retail as what would fall into this criteria. But those not fed on a high energy diet, so grass fed has an appeal to that consumer because it has a lower fat content we'll find that it has typically a higher percentage of unsaturated fats, mainly polyunsaturated fats or the um, omega fats. And the, the biggest downside to that though is that they're far less efficient. And so price point per pound is very different between a conventional and a grass fed. And that's mainly the restriction of we don't have the land space say Brazil has or Australia, New Zealand. And there's a reason why we feed cattle the way we do. Uh, but this would have been or is continually a, a small growing segment that uh, if I had to put a number on it represents less than 5% of what you can find in the grocery store. How is controlled the humanely raised competition? Humanely raised, that is uh, done by a few different methods. We have uh, auditing firms that will go out and make those assessments on farms. A lot of these, if they're done in a large cooperative, will have an agreement with a packer and then ultimately have some sort of relationship with the retailer that they're sending it through. So here, Walmart is growing that segment of their brand. And so they have a, a cooperative agreement with a farm in the Pacific Northwest. And to qualify into that program, they are audited uh, biannually to make that assessment. So, the only two programs USDA Correct. That is it. As, as well, and then you would have, you know, prime choice in those designations, but... Yep. And so to finish off, uh, really, this is the largest growing protein segment in the U.S. Uh, when the cattle market goes south, this is a way to ensure stability in your portfolio. Uh, this is the way that large entities such as Tyson, JBS, and Cargill are now acquiring growth. So the current model in the U.S. is for those companies to diversify away from fresh meats and to get into beginning to add to their portfolio a value-added products. So Tyson has bought uh, Advanced Food Pierre, Hillshire, so a lot of different brands now that they can send their product to to add value. I mean that is the concept in the US. One of the big driving forces for our consumer base now is convenience. Uh, I, there's not uh, a large percentage of people that cook at home anymore as there were 50 years ago. So if you look at the influx of meals eaten at home and meals eaten away from home, it's almost equal. And so that's one reason why there's so much uh, money to be made kind of in this value added category. Something that you can take, it's ready in five to 10 minutes and you don't have to deal with the meal prep that say you would with the, the fresh meat case. And so when cattle market goes down, as it typically does, everything is cyclical in some nature. This is a way for those companies to kind of keep things stable and then to add value to that lower end item. These typically have a more stable price point than fresh meats will. Any questions? All right, 
We are gonna go back over to the meat lab. We will get frocks. And so now we're gonna look at primals. We have the, the carcasses set out as, uh, as what we refer to in the US as a judging class. So for you to kind of look and make evaluations on if you want to write some notes and then to make sure that we stay on track, we have already done the fabrication process for you. I have a worksheet of those retail cuts and we'll look at the, the composition differences between the, the four live animals that we looked at and their carcasses.